The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble, featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Nicola Beswick from FMD today. Nicola, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Absolute uh, pleasure. Lovely to be here on, I will say, a sunny Melbourne day. (laughs) (laughs) It is for once, isn't it? We've had a bit of a run of the nice warm weather. Have you been getting out, enjoying it at all, or you're stuck in the you're in the office by the looks of things? You're stuck inside all day. Stuck inside all day, um, but try try to make the most of it when I get home. I'm very much one thing that I have done this year at the start of the year was taken up running. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So um, from ten years of not actually running, um, I got back into it and thought, you know, start doing something that's going to help me survive my crazy life at the moment. <laughs> Did you do any of the Melbourne Marathon events, the half marathon or the 5Ks or any of those types of things? I did the 10K. Oh, yeah, good on you. First 10K in a long time um, and it went according to my race plan in my head. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was so wrapped. Um, and that finishes in the MCG as well. So you still finish in yeah, the MCG. Yeah. And you get a, do you get a medal and all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's proudly it's hanging up on my wall at home. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm very proud of myself for getting through it. Um, financial planning 101, isn't it? You kind of set yourself a goal, and then it sounds like you had a bit of a training plan to uh, to execute on the goal. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. You're exactly it, and. Um, and the nice thing, and this I'll use the financial planning kind of things, those little things that come along and you don't expect them, but they really help you. Yeah. Um, I had at the 8K mark where I knew the whole mental barrier would come in, my favourite song of all time came up on my playlist. And Is that timed on purpose? Or no, yeah. no. And so I was absolutely wrapped. It was no timing whatsoever on my part with that. Yeah. Um, and it just just that extra little bit of yeah, yep, boost. Boost. Yeah. yeah. Good on you. Good on you. Well, we're going to talk financial planning stuff rather than running stuff because I'm not much of a not much of a runner. We I I you know obviously met you for the first time. A couple of weeks ago on the uh, financial standard uh, event there, and we're sitting on the couch and we're talking about all of these different things, and I kind of felt like I'm not doing enough when there was you and John there going, "Oh, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this." I'm like, hey, I just put some videos on TikTok. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's about it. So, so maybe we'll 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 talk in a bit of detail about the different things that you're up to. But yeah. so you're take about, maybe talk us about your role at FMD to begin with, and we'll I don't know we'll we'll go from there. Definitely, definitely. So I've been at FMD Financial for just on three years now, uh, and I am a senior advisor here. Um, it's one of these places where I I have the ability to do all these little extra things that just I do. Um, got a lot of really great support um, with the team. Really great team behind me that. Uh, helps me particularly with some of the the clients and some of those, you know, how you just have people that uh, you work really, really well with together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really, really fortunate with that. Um, But it's whenever I talk to anyone about what I do, I just, I love, I love financial planning. I love what we do as a a profession and 
Um, being able to do it in a place where I've got really great supporters is amazing. Mm. So what what is, what is that? You know, there's a match of supporters from a business perspective and them letting you do the things that you want to do. <laughs> yeah. But what, but what does your support look like from a client-based perspective? Like do you have a an associate advisor with you? Do you have a client service manager? Like what does what your little bit of a structure look like? Uh, so we've got a, a team of associate advisors uh, that help the advisors here, particularly when you've got new client, new prospective clients coming in. Um, yep. I know if all the advisors listening on to into this, there's so much that always goes on in a new client meeting that you have to be really aware of, and having a second person there to help um, see where you're heading, ask the questions that you may not have. Um, thought of or get a different perspective and then, you know, all importantly, make sure you're doing all your file notes and things like that. Um, They're there as well from that support team. But then also I think it's important because that gives a client another point of contact um, if I'm not available and and that I think is worth its weight in gold. Yeah, absolutely. I've also then got um, some wonderful client services team behind me um, and, again, I use the same expression with their weight of gold as well in terms of that kind of um, liaising with all the bits and pieces behind the scenes, that real administrative um, component that goes into um, our roles um, yep. and allows us to just do the things that we I say we're good at. Um, so I'm not. I'm not so good on maybe filling in paperwork sometimes, but that's what they, they're good at. Um, yeah. Are both of those? Are both of those the associate advisor and the client services? Are both of those pooled teams, or do you have like a dedicated associate advisor, dedicated client service manager? What does that look like? Uh, so I've got a dedicated uh, client service manager, um, yep. and then the associate advisors are. It's an interesting. Um, structure. So it is pulled. Uh, but I think with a pulled system, you naturally end up um, having people available at different times um, when the client comes in. Then you've also got um, the people that will know will work well with particular client situations. So you just end up, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on um, how you look at it, gravitating to specific people for specific yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. So in that like in that new client, it sounds like you with a new client, you've got an associate advisor coming into that meeting with you, as you said, to help you if you, there's questions that you forget to ask for when or whatever else might be going on. Do, do they then somehow get tagged to, the, to that client so that they're then involved in that client's journey through the process or, or does someone else come in? Like, how, how do you deal with that? Um at the moment, currently, they're mm. tagged and uh, we've got a field and next plan where it's you've got a the advisor and then the associate advisor role. So that um, system allows everyone else to know who the associate advisor is for that particular client. Um, so they do follow the, the journey um, and I haven't got to a stage where I've had to swap adv- associate advisors or anything like that. Um, there may be one or two just from a timing perspective and so forth, but yeah. uh, generally it works. Um, and it's. I think when you come back from it from a client perspective, they know they've got that person. They know there's going to be that consistency along their journey as well. And that's ultimately what we're doing is helping someone on their journey and to have that support and that structure there, I think, is really, really valuable. Mm, it's a good way of doing it. So we have, we, we're kind of the reverse. We have a, we have an associate advisor that you kind of buddied up with, you, you, that works directly with you, but then a pooled client services team and 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 the feedback we get from time to time are amongst the associate advisors. Like my associate advisor's just had a few days off. Mm. He's going to come back to a whole bunch of stuff that's coming from clients that. You know, then there's no pool of, of tasks that are being done. Whereas if that was all, as much as they might be tagged to a particular client, but at least if they're on leave, the bulk of their work can still be done by other people in the team. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. It's I think talking to different people, there's, there's so many different ways to get a cat, so to speak, in this situation. Yes, and I don't know if any 
there's pros and cons for all of them. Um, and you know, you're right. It's it's always when things have put at these stresses, stress points where you really find where that um, I'd, I'd say weak point is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but it is. It's it's. If you've got, I think it comes down to the people you're working with as well. And if you know that, I know from recent experience, I went away on holiday for 10 days. Um, it was the first time in my whole working life, this is going to sound really terrible, that I completely switched off my emails, yeah. didn't do anything. Um, and I could do that because I knew the people that were there behind me had being involved with the work that was going on. And I had complete confidence in that. And I I love that. Yeah. Um, it was really and and what even made it even more wonderful is there was a couple of really key things that came up during that break. Um that the team just they just dealt with it. Mm. They um they knew what to do. They knew um the clients. So these were particularly in these situations. One was a new prospective client. One was an existing client, um, because the associate advisor had no one had been involved with that client through those journeys. They knew them. The client felt comfortable. They could sort it all out. And then when I got back to my desk at probably Monday morning or something like that, um, she was like, "Okay, this has happened. This has happened. This has happened. And this is what I've done. And this is what I've done. And we're going to call this client now. Now." And it was just. Yeah. It was really nice. It just Fantastic. reinforced that ability to, yeah, I can just switch off. And do they have so the the associated advisors or someone else? Do they have access to your emails? Do that, or or, you, or do clients not email you directly? They email the associate. Like, how's that client communication thing? Because like, if I think of if I didn't if I switched off for ten days, which I should, but I never do. Yeah. If 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 I did, you know, there'd be. A ton of unread emails that no one would have actioned because no one's looking at my in, in my emails. And how did you deal with that? I I put a lot of trust in the out of office system, yep. um, and I think because I knew this trip was coming up, um, a lot of the clients I had regular contact with knew I was going away. Yeah. Um, and it just yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. You get you come back from you know, a couple of weeks off and there's still these emails that you have to go through and you know it seems like a big overwhelming thing but you, you know this is coming back to me started running again you know you need to um somehow take those mental checklists and you know have faith in the technology i'm laughing as i say that sentence um but you know it is a little bit of that self-care it is that um you know, making sure that we're taking up time for ourselves so we can do our job better. Yeah, yeah. And I say that I sound like I'm doing this really well, but I'm not. <laughs> you know I mean? no, you've done it. I, I couldn't say put my hand up and say I went on a 10-day holiday and I didn't look at my emails once. I'll, I'll, I'll last 10 hours and then I'll look at them. I, uh, I'm a shocker yeah. when it comes to that. So you've, so you've been at FMD for three years. What, what were you up to before joining FMD? So before that, I was at a company called GFM Wealth Advisory, um, and they are very specific SMSF focused. Uh, so I was there for, gosh, just over six years. Yes, um, yes. And then before that, it I was at, and this is my first ever job in financial planning, um, a, a little small boutique business in Armdale. Um, and I am forever grateful for this guy, Gary, employing me. Um, uh, this was my first job out of my, my legal, my other, my other previous legal career life. He was the first person out of around probably 400, um, applications that I sent off that offered me a job. 400? Yeah. So I, and I know that because I literally kept every single cover letter I sent off um, when, and when I was looking for a job and it was that, um, you know, it, it was something that I just went, I know I really want to do this yeah. and I'm just not going to stop um, until I actually get a role. Um, and it was initially a part-time power planning position, um, which then led into a full-time position um, yeah. between me 
getting the job and then signing a contract. And without him, um, I would not be where I am today. No. Um, because that's that was a huge leap of faith, I think. Um one thing I think with him, uh, he see the transferable skills that I had. So before getting into financial advice, I was an intellectual property patent attorney and I was there, I did that for 10 or so years. Um, you know, very specialized. Um, but what I found was I think when you go for job application, go, go through a change of career or you're going through a new like role, is that real checkbox kind of thing that's unfortunately we we all do it for, to some extent but he I think almost saw just those skills that I had and yeah. being able to transfer across and, and um yeah to this day whenever I look back at what I've done and what I've achieved so far I just I think of that and I think of just that really defining moment where um, someone someone finally took a chance on me. Yeah, a chance. I, I can't believe that it took 400 attempts for someone to give you a chance. Like, yeah, different story. I don't know if you're completely uneducated and you can't like, you, you, but you had a career yeah. 10 years into in, in, in as, a, as a lawyer and then, and then it was, took 400 goes for someone to give you a chance to yeah. jump the jump across into financial advice. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, it was <laughs> at the time it was pretty um you know, you get you go through all the emotions, don't you? Of course. With this. And and as you're talking about that, I'd actually even finished my um diploma in financial planning as well because I would I was studying at the same time getting that and I went, no, I knew what I had to do and yeah, so it's well, good on them for giving you the chance. Yeah. Uh, we're all yeah. better for it, I think, because of it. Thank you. How, so what what was it that made you want to change? Well, like why you know, you seem pretty committed to it if you're you're doing your diploma of financial planning or whatever studying you're doing at the same time as a as a completely different career. What was the change? Uh it all it all came about um from my dad. Um so my my dad was Oh, back then, about five years ago. Now, I've, time's gone really fast, but mm. he um, was a person. He's a person living with multiple sclerosis, okay. um, and for him, that manifested in a way where he essentially lost a lot of his right side. So, couldn't write, um, couldn't shave. Um, he uses a, a cane now um, to walk, and. Back then, um, he was uh, an executive at Telecom, so the equivalent of Telstra here. That's true, yeah. um, and he, it took them three years, his medical team, three years to essentially diagnose what he had. Um, and he eventually couldn't work um, anywhere near the, the role that he was doing. And so he ended up um, going on an income protection payout. And so that for me, when I, and I distinctly remember the conversation that I had with dad sitting in the cafe back in Auckland, um, where we were talking about him getting this income protection payout and what that meant for him and my stepmom and mm. um, how that then meant they didn't have to worry so much about money right then. And I went, oh, the crap, I've been to sort my eyes. Stuff yeah. out. I don't know anything about finance. Um, you know, I was just working along in, in a legal job and, you know, same kind of story we hear all the time and time again. And yeah. I just, from that learning for my own benefit, seeing what dad and Ellie, um, so Ellie, my stepmom, um, their situation and how their lives changed, um, it just, to me, it was like a no brainer. Yeah. Um, just that being able to really influence someone's life for the better. Mm. And you hear so many stories of you know, the, the circumstances are all different, but some event in my family happened and this thing happened and that set in motion, this in your case, the career change. A lot. It seems to be people in financial advice, they either just ended up there because they just somehow ended up there, they got a job and it just continued on or- yep. 
or they're like you that there's been, there's some trigger point, and quite often that's something in your family, your dad, you know, with his with his diagnosis, yeah. has has triggered the change. Yeah, and that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so it's it's wonderful because well, it's wonderful finding this sense of fulfillment and passion yes. through something that um, is obviously quite a life changing experience. Um, for some for someone else, and yeah. I think for me, whenever I'm seeing people and sitting in front of clients, that's the way you can kind of look at things. So, who are you? Who are you typically working with now? Like I said, you, the previous business was a you know a lot of SMSF work by the sounds of things, a bit of a specialty in SMSF. Who? What do your typical clients look like now? Uh, so now I have I I kind of put them in. Two separate camps. <laughs> um, you are uh, certainly like a, a lot of uh, financial planners out there. I've got the the I say I say standard standard the the common kind of um, pre retirees retirees people that know that they're getting to that point in life where they they do have to think of um, what they're going to do when they eventually retire. Um, so you know they're certainly. In that standard journey, that a number of people will be able to understand. the The second group of people are people that have gone through some kind of compensation. So yeah. workers, workers' compensation, TAC payouts, TPD payouts. So people that are uh, have gone through some kind of trauma or trigger or something that has really disrupted their life. Um, and for them, it's, you know, if you, if you think about what they, what they need from a financial planning space, it's a very similar kind of role as retirees or pre-retirees. But what I love about those type of clients is there is so much you can do for them. Um, you can actually, you know, if you set things up right from, you know, you can look at Centrelink, you can invest the money, you can you know, create a, a pension for someone who is in their forties because of this and they've still got that regular income stream. You know, it's all those little kind of intricacies that really help someone when they've gone through the worst. Yeah. And how did you how did you get into that? I think it was initially just uh like I knew that's what I thought financial planning is. I if that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, but I it it was through working with a client advocate for a legal firm um, who came in one day with a particular client who and I can't I can't remember the client specifically, but I can remember the situation, and it was that situation where um, they had got a TAC payout. Um, they knew that that money had to last for the rest of that person's life. Mm. And this is the common thing with a couple of them. And as I'm talking, I'm thinking about a couple of the clients I've seen. I've seen a, a gentleman who was in his early 30s get completely brain damaged and had something has something like 5% mental capacity. And yeah. his dad... Um, is now his his person that has to manage everything. Um, I've got a lady, um, young lady, who had a car accident at the age of I think it's twenty one and got a TAC payout, and she she's not working at the moment and survives on income and a little bit of Centrelink. So it's it was just through that real connection with this client advocate and then talking to these people that she'd kind of brought in and mm. I sat down and talked through that I just went, this is why we exist. You know, really, these sounds people. really fulfilling work. For yeah. Me. Yeah. I I, I, re- I get a lot of joy out of it. I get a lot of joy out of that real piece of work and and helping those people. And so is that is that how these clients with these different different you know TAC payouts or whatever is that how they're finding you in the first place? Is it through some relationship with a lawyer or whoever's dealing with the compensation claim? Then they're saying, "Hey, you should go and talk to Nicola." Like, how yeah. how are they finding you in the first place? That's exactly it. It's yeah. it's all about the relationships. It's all about building the relationships with like lawyers. 
um, that specialize in this area. And and what I found over time is lawyers love understanding what it is that you're doing for clients and um, the the reasons why. And a couple of lawyers that I I spent a little bit of time with. Um, we had two clients we were working on together and I had lunch with them, ended up telling them, okay, this is what I'm doing for them and drew out, drew out on a small napkin mm. what we were doing and talked through the strategy and why. And that's, the penny just dropped. Yeah. They they could really see the benefits of clients building a relationship with someone um, and how it could work. Um, mm. And so I just... I think, you know, when when you think about us and what we do as a profession, we know what we do, we know how the benefits of doing it, but the general public don't. Yeah, that's it. And and that's the if you can if you can find a way of explaining what it is that you do in a simple enough way that people can understand it, that's when you start to have that that level of success, whether it's drawing it on a napkin, whether it's doing a video on TikTok or something like that, but making it digestible and so that people can listen, oh, actually, that's what Nicola does. And I hear, yeah, I know a lot of other people that could deal with that kind of help and then yeah. and then off it goes. Yeah. 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 So so I um I stumbled across your website a couple of weeks ago. I just Googled your name and uh and this amazing website comes up. What's this what's the story behind that? Uh so this was this was again another I say leap of faith. A, a lovely friend of mine who is also a, a coach uh, said to me, "You need to get a personal website because people build by people." Mm. Um, he didn't probably say it quite like that, but that was the essence of the conversation. Um, and you know, the more I thought about that and thought about what um, something from a, a personal website perspective can do is it helps people get to understand you as a as a person. It's a bit like you with your, your videos, your TikToks, you know, people um they watch you, they un, they get to um understand who you are, they can see it, it, you in real life. And I think that builds that connection, it builds that trust that is so important with what we do. And so yeah, went through this this it was actually in a really incredible journey putting it all together um, in terms of making sure that you've got all the right elements, you know, the colours, the the all those bits and pieces. And um, it was it was an amazing experience and I absolutely love it as well. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it's, for me, it's, it helps share that journey and um, communicate why I do what I do. I think it's I think it's a really good bridge between like you know we're talking about a, a lawyer dealing with a TAC payment and then saying hey you should go and talk to Nicola, and then the f- the first thing that they're going to do if they have any interest in talking to you they're going to Google your your name. I'm sure the FMD website will come up and there's you with the FMD website, but I think it's a good bridge in between, yes. or it's it it's you know it, it makes a reference that you work at FMD, but but it talks about you as a person and you know nice colors and photos and all of these kind of things yeah. Yeah. and then quite separately there's the fmd website it's yep. yeah it's really good I was, yeah I was impressed i kind of wrote it down on my list of things to eventually get to for myself <laughs> definitely definitely because you're you're the way you've articulated it is so right you know it is that that bridge between um people yes you can see us on a website and you got a little blur but then you don't really get the depth of understanding who it is that we are and why and that sense of purpose hmm. um, yeah. and and building that connection. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. Now, the the other thing that I wanted to tackle with you is the uh, pro bono work that, that, that you do. Um, yeah. What, you know, you would, I don't even know where to start with it. What to, what do we what are you up to? Who, you know, what's the group? How do you how does that all come together? Tell us a bit about the pro bono work. Ah, uh, so this is um another one of these um very fortunate moments in my life, which I look back and I'm smiling and I'm really excited about is the pro the pro bono financial advice network is um a group of advisors. 
uh, that are willing to help clients that can't ordinarily afford advice get advice. Um, now that is extremely vague and I know there's a lot of people out there that would fit within that um, like very definition. So what we do is we help people with illness or injury um, and we um, are building relationships with specific charities yep. um, because, again, there's so many people out there that would fit into that camp. Um, we've had to, the board and, and I have ta- had to take in the approach of let's just work with specific charities and help um, them first. And as we get more advisors on board, um, then we can help more and more people. The charities we work with, so the multiple sclerosis community. And so this not surprising. Not surprising. <laughs> um and that was actually how I got involved was because uh MS was their charity um when I started looking at pro bono work and and a girlfriend of mine who actually has MS as well, she suggested I got in contact with the group. So I did and it's just the the relationships um, just built from there and there. So I, I joined as an advisor um, and then uh, did, did some webinars and then I was asked to be a director, and, uh, which I was extremely excited about. Um, yes, or for the... Oh, for the Pro Bono Financial yeah, Advice Network. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then the last year... Um, decided to leave and um, basically went around and asked everyone that they thought I should be chair and they all agreed and he rings me up and goes, I'm leaving and we want you to be the chair. And I'm like, sure, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that was, that was again, another really big career highlight for me. And um, since then we've, we've, started working with the motion neuron disease community, so MND mm. um, and Pancare, so they pancreatic cancer and upper GI tract um, cancers. So those, unfortunately, those two illnesses, they're, they're terminal. Yeah. Um, MS, you know, you, you, it's not terminal. Um, so, you know, this is, I guess, where I do my little plug and say, advisors, we need you. Um, all we need is for you to put your hand up for one case a year um, so we can help more and more people coming through those those three charities. Yeah, so what, is it, what does it look like in terms of the, the advice that you're doing? So is it you know, you're, you're running some, some webinars to some people at large? Is, is it do you then get into individual like fully-fledged statements of advice and, you know, just like anyone that might be paying your fee. Yep. Like can, can you talk about the different ways that you're interacting with people from MS or you know, the other other community groups? Of course, of course. So what we are is we're – so PFAN or the Pro Bono Network is like a conduit yep. from these uh, clients or charities coming through. What we do is we have a, a simple questionnaire that the clients fill out. Uh, we then make sure that, yes, they can't afford advice just because, you know, they they may be extremely wealthy and um, they could pay for advice. We, what we're focusing on is those clients that aren't ordinarily. Yeah. Um, so you get some get, sense of their asset position or something before and, and there's a decision as they get you. As much as you... You need our help. You can afford to pay for it, but this person also needs our help, and they can't afford to pay for it. Hundred percent. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then once they go, once the client goes, I call them clients. Once that person mm-hmm. goes through that assessment, and we go, yes, they fit that criteria. We then put the call out to advisors on our register. What we try and do is match advisors and clients based on skills and yep. needs. Um, so. We we have a, a range of advisors all around the country um, that that we try and that we we record what their areas of expertise are, what areas they don't want to provide advice in or can't, um, and then we match them up. And then hopefully, when the call goes out, an advisor puts their hand up and says, "Yes, I've got capacity to take that client on." We then uh, introduce them to each other, so the client and the advisor, and let them carry on as like a normal relationship. Yep. 
we very much that then becomes the advisor's obligations in terms of what they need to do, et cetera, et cetera. We, you know, very much each each case that from a client perspective is very different. So whether it's a phone call, a chat versus doing a statement of advice, you know, that's all we ask clients, advisors to do. Um, yeah. We don't expect advisors to have an ongoing relationship free of charge. That obviously is not fair on anyone, um, but it's just that initial contact and that ability for people to feel, hey, I may not be in a position where I can afford advice or I can, I really just feel really bad about where I am and and, and feel really guilty. And, and this is a, a place where they can go to and have someone that has the expertise to help guide them. We've had so many wonderful stories at, off the back of oh, it. I'm sure you would. Yeah. 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 And and I think that comes back to really showcasing the difference advisors can make in people's lives. Yeah. So it's it's a fan. I've got to, again, this is why I run uh, <laughs> because it is very mm-hmm. much like a second job and um, there's so much going on. But, you know, I'm really fortunate there to have so much support um, with my board members. They all bring in different areas of expertise and skills. Um, We've got the support of um, a marketing team within Hub24. So, you know, that's fantastic. Um, And we've just employed in the 10-year history of PFAM being around our very first admin person. My very first person, yeah. So... Where do you get the money from to employ them? Like, is it through sponsorships and things? How do you? Yep. How does yep. it all work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, with just through through sponsors, um, yep. and the support of, I think there's so many organisations out there that are looking for ways to give back, and you know, when we and particularly organisations that are in the financial mm. space, they get it. We've we've had a lot of um, interest and and a lot of um, support financially from from people, particularly over the last few years. So it's been it's wonderful, absolutely mm-hmm. wonderful to see that. So if anyone wants to get where did where did people go to get involved if they want to be one of the advisors on the on the list of of people doing the pro bono work? Where do they where do they go to for that? So we've got a a uh, website. Uh, so probonoadvice.com.au. Uh, and then we also have an email address, support at probonoadvice.com.au as well. So that goes to the beautiful Liz, who now looks after all of that admin stuff. <laughs> First of all, I'm employee. Yes. So what is, so what is your, and like that, that itself almost sounds like a full-time job, as you said, and then you have your full-time senior advisor. Like, what is your, what does your week look like or your month? Like, how do you, how do you split your time? How do you manage that? Um... That's a good question. <laughs> um, I I'm ever learning time management. Mm. Um, I'm also ever learning to question whether I need to do something or can someone else do it. Um, and this again comes into that support piece and mm. and having that those people around you um, to really help navigate these things as they come up and and knowing who to go to with yeah. these questions um so it's it has been something that has been ever evolving um it's definitely something that I'm still learning and yes. you know each each week is is different and each month's different and, and yeah and it sounds like you've got the support of FMD whether you know from a business perspective you know and associated advisors client services to to let you just do you by the yep. by the sounds of things and and they're happy with with you doing you. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're exactly you're exactly right. <laughs> um, exactly right. And um I think, you know, I'm really I'm really lucky in that regard, you know, yeah. in terms of being able to I I can I can be me. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, Nicola, we might ra- leave it there, wrap it up there. Thank you for joining me on this Monday afternoon as, as we're recording this. Thank you for your time. Lots of lots of amazing stuff that you're up to there. We'll put some links to the the, the website that you mentioned and 
and your own and so forth in the show notes for anyone that, that wants to reach out and, and, and get amongst it. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for spending spending time with me as well. <laughs> Always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>